welcome to our session. Uh, my name is Michael Keynes. I'm the Associate Dean of Graduate Studies in the Office of Graduate Studies. Uh, and let me have my co-conspirators okay. introduce themselves. Okay. I am Marche Hall, um, Project Assistant for the Office of Graduate Studies. Um, I've been working on our TARA trainings for the past two years. And I'm Martin Oliver from the Department of Philosophy and Religion, and not really from the Office of Graduate <laughs> Studies. <laughs> uh, as well be. They we knew. <laughs> they didn't. Yeah. Except that I, uh, I, um, I run the, the actual graduate assistant seminars at the, at the beginning of the year. So um, I'm, the, I'm the face of, face to the, teach, to the students, I suppose. And, and we actually probably, Marche correctly pointed out, we should have probably called this RIT orientation rather than training. Yeah. And we want to give you a sense of what we've been doing in the past couple of years. And actually, the, part of the goal of this is not just to talk about what we've been doing, but to find out what's being done and to get some feedback from you because this is really a new area for us. Um, so overall, we, like I said, we've been doing TA training for two years. Um, it's not really been content specific because we're doing it for the entire university. And it is intended to, and I really want to stress this, complement but not replace that trainings that go on within the departments and the schools. My department is the uh, <coughs> Department of Mathematics and Statistics, and I can tell you we, did, we don't do anything for our um, teacher training, or TA training for our graduate students. And most of the people, is there, was there anything done in your no, department? God, no, no. And when I talk to most <laughs> faculty, the answer is generally no. So we wanted to do something, and the question was, well, what can we do that's, that's appropriate, but not necessarily, necessarily um, specifics to the particular content area? So um, there was a lot of materials out there, actually, for TA training. We're going to talk a little bit about what we chose to do for a curriculum. Um, one of the things that came up was that a lot of people said, hey, I'm, I'm actually not a TA, I'm an RA. Um, and, and I would like an orientation, too. So last year, we started trying to do our first forays into research system training. Um, and one of the big differences is that you go out there and you Google research system training, you find almost nothing. And so in some sense, that's part of what we want to talk to you about, too, is that this is just something new that we have, and we have some ideas on how we want to proceed forward. Um, and especially the challenges of not being content specific. We're talking about RA training for everybody, not just for your particular area. Um, and so some of the goals that we have for this is we want to explain a little more, more detail what we did, uh, elaborate on some of our plans for the future. Uh, we want to get information from you about what we already do do. And in particular, try and get some feedback and discussion for next steps. And you know, this is a, actually a nice sized group because I, we really do need your feedback. This is actually really critical for us. We'll start planning out next year soon and we want to figure out what to do. So uh, just a little bit of an outline of today's talk. Marche will talk about how we got started with our TA training and um, what the students' responses to the orientation were and give a little bit of information on what the current curriculum is. Um, I'm going to talk about a uh, document that our office produced, which was graduate assistant guidelines, and um, what we do with them now in our uh, within the curriculum for our training, and to consider start look, using case studies as a way to, to do uh, um, some training, in particular around these. And Martin will talk about the successes and challenges from the first two years of running our program. So we hope to be done in a few minutes with what we present, and then get the conversation started. So. You know, we wanted that from you. Well, let's uh, begin with uh, Marche. Here we go. Don't hurt. Slide on. <coughs> Slide on out. Yeah. <coughs> so, sorry. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay. So in 2013, about uh, about this time, February, March. We were tasked by Dr. Tubman to begin to think about and provide sort of an institution-wide general TA um, orientation where students could learn about um, policies, they could learn about how to communicate with professors and students, a little bit about grading, and some of the sort of basic things that would help them get a good start um, as they began their teaching assistant positions. So during the fall semester of 2013 and also the fall 2014, um, we did six sessions, there were three hours each um, over the first two weeks of the fall semesters. Um, again, as Michael has said, they are much more of an institution-wide overview. 
um, if there are specific procedures or anything that goes on within each school or unit. We really didn't touch upon those, but just more general skills about AU policies, um, AU institutional-wide procedures, and various things like that. Um, we had 91 students attend the first year from all across campus, and then for this last fall, we had 46 students attend uh, for our second year of the training. Um, through the surveys more of last year, we found that a healthy percentage, probably almost more than half of the students who attended our TA training were actually RAs. And so we found that there was a little bit of, maybe a little bit of mismatch between what we wanted to do for the TA training and what students were actually doing. And so we um, decided to implement an RA session for this fall to kind of address some of that, that need that we saw that we weren't able to address the year before. And so basically what we covered in both TA and RA orientations, this was both last year and this year, um, communication, as I said, working with your mentor, how to ask questions, how to air grievances, who to go to if you are having issues, and how to deal with students and issues that they may have in the classroom as well. Academic integrity, um, we got uh, some good pieces about um, how to assign different papers so that there's actually a learning component, how to deal with plagiarism, how to deal with your own research and whether a professor's plagiarism is something you wrote or um, you know it's plagiarism from another, from the professor themselves. Um, we also discussed the graduate assistant um, guidelines, which is what I handed out to you um, right before the session began, and Michael will go into that a little bit further about why we came up with those and kind of what we wanted to make sure that students got from those. Um, time management, how to manage your own work as well as your work for your professors and any grading, any interaction with students in that work. And then campus resources, um, how to learn different types of software. We talked about Blackboard, uh, different research software, different educational experience and, and resources that you could get that would help enhance your teaching experience. And then for our RAs, um, we actually discussed, uh, just for TAs actually, grading and then FERPA, and how to address grading and different things to the student and parents, various things like that. So as you can see, most of our work has been mostly geared towards TAs, and what we're kind of looking for today is expanding out our RAs and kind of bolstering and improving those sessions. And so we did surveys, um, which I uh, can actually pass around the packets. I have a copy of the survey that we gave to all of our participants, um, the, all both years of our of our trainings, and we got 91 surveys back and 40 surveys for this year. 91 year before. Um, we asked them about whether they wanted to do a follow-up session, like after you did our, we did our first six sessions, they wanted like a mid-semester session or something towards the end so they could see whether they applied the knowledge and what they felt they needed to learn once they had a little bit of experience under their belt. Um, there was kind of lukewarm that first year. I'm like, oh, well, if you want to do it, that's fine. If not, that's fine too. But this year, we really felt people wanted, it was 3.5, they really wanted that additional support and additional follow-up. Um, people felt that the orientation was pretty useful in 2013 and 14. Um, I believe we did uh, follow-up sessions that we may get and then ask them if the orientation was useful. I think we might get a little more useful number there so they could actually compare what they learned in the session versus what their experience actually ended up being. And in 2013 we asked them um, if they would recommend the session to another student or to another incoming TA or RA. Um, in 2014, it was a pretty good rating, 3.5. In, 2000, in 2014, got a little bit higher. So it seemed like we were able to maybe tailor the session a little bit more. So that was something that they would recommend and share with other students as well. And here's another important rating, something that I think we'll need to address as well. In 2013, they felt they learned more, whereas in 2014, they maybe didn't feel as they learned as much. And from comments that we received on the surveys, we found that they may have had another orientation within an apartment and that we covered some of the same information, and others felt that, um, well, it was a comment since we already knew it. Um, but again, others still thought it was very useful. Okay, All right, mind? so talk a little bit about the guidelines for duties and evaluations of graduate, uh, uh, graduate assistants. These are just, we, I called them GAs for sort of a combination of RAs and TAs. Uh, so when I started this job, uh, I said, 
I was told, hey, yeah, we have no guidelines. We have nothing for how to appropriately te te deal with graduate assistants. There were no rules. And technically, shh, a little secret between us, there still aren't. No, oh, <laughs> that's right. These are guidelines. You didn't hear that. <laughs> These yeah. are guidelines. Yeah. One day, awesome. maybe they should be considered policy or they should be at least considered to be looked at as policy. But there are guidelines that are out there. We highly recommend them. We have them on our website. You're getting the shortened version that we handed out to the students. Um, these were used to establish appropriate roles and responsibilities for GAs. This is to both uh, to both protect the not only the graduate assistants, but to protect the departments. To be able to say, wow, that's not, that's not appropriate uh, responsibilities. This is what you need to do. This is what we should be doing. So I'm going to basically sum them up into two key takeaways. It's only a five-page um, guideline document. But the key takeaways, first of all, was that supervisors and graduate assistants should meet before the semester to establish clear duties. And they should meet after the semester to evaluate the performance. I think that's great for the GA because they know what they're expected to do. I think that's great for the, the professor and the department because they can say, you know, you're not really doing what you were supposed to be doing, or you're doing a great job, but that there's some accountability associated with it. Um, <coughs> but here's the other one. We really love this. We tried to give a definition as to what is appropriate for a GA to do. And I love this because it says it should do two things. First, the GA's work should benefit the school, the department, the university, something to the effect that it's, it's good for us. But second, it needs to be good for them. It needs to advance the professional development of the GA. Now, part of the reason one may think about this is to avoid the pick up my dry cleaning circumstance, which by the way, yes, we've probably had our chair picking up dry cleaning. Um, but it actually does more. And this is kind of one of the things I want to talk about because there's actually some depth behind that statement. And one of the things we wanted to consider was actually looking at case studies. Whoops. So, in the past, what have we done? Well, we've given out the shortened version that you got <coughs> an example of. And, and I really recommend for you to go look at the longer version. This is kind of boiled down. But the longer version goes into a lot more detail about what's appropriate for a GA. Um, and we hope that the students might actually be encouraged to ask, well, exactly what would you like me to do? And let's set that up. Um, the idea for the future is to consider case studies and to say, well, here's the situation. Is that appropriate or is that not appropriate for this? And I'll tell you, as we talk about them, these situations actually become complex. And I've talked to other AU professors. Some of them, these are controversial that I'll show you that are coming up. Uh, these have been successfully used in TA training, but we have very little in RA training because there's little out there. So first, one question before we could even do that is, is this even worthwhile not being content specific? And isn't there just sort of a sense of dry cleaning is bad everything else is good. Do we do we really need to get into it? And I wanted to pose these two ones for you just to ask you to think, well, would you say this is appropriate or inappropriate? So here are two. First, Jane is an RA for a professor in psychology. She's actually part of the BCAN, which is Behavioral Cognition and Neuroscience. And that professor has a neuroscience research grant. Big grant. Great. So what is Jane supposed to do? Well, first she's supposed to help with the budget for the grant. She's supposed to keep track of the inventory and order more supplies. You know, this grant has a lot of technical parts to it. She is developing the NSF progress report that's needed to keep the grant going. Um, she also is helping to organize the NSF supported conference that's associated with this grant. And if there's any time left, she's in the lab, but a lot of times she's not in the lab. So my question, is that appropriate or inappropriate? The description? Is the description appropriate? No. Is this duty? Are these duties? Okay. Is this appropriate for a GA? Yeah. Is that yeah. your criteria that they, I think they help the department as a unit or professor, and they do a fair amount of professional development? It's. Would you all agree? Yeah. I mean, as a, <laughs> as a GA, I would say. Yeah. I would prefer more time in the lab, but all those things are things that people who run researchers who run projects need to know how to do. And we totally agree. And and yeah, yeah you got it right. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, but part of this, and, and actually I was called to task. I was talking to uh, another academic friend who said, well, what if they never get in the lab? And I said, you know, if they never get in the lab, then I would say you're having diminishing returns on the professional development for the GA. 
and that at some point lab work is important, especially in that area. Much like if your GA was to do one thing in the lab for six years, that's probably not a good thing if you're not trying to diversify what you do. But the fact that you come in with grant experience, that's key, that looks really good. That's something that has professional development. Second situation. Well, Joe is an RA in a, for professor in anthropology, and this professor is organizing a weekly research seminar for the semester. In fact, they've already had some people come in who are here on leave, or they're here actually on sabbatical. Big group of people in this particular area, a lot of interest in this. So what Joe does for the first three weeks, he does with the professor an extensive lit review for the seminar. Then after that, he's gonna photocopy and scan in the readings for the seminar. He'll disseminate the readings to the seminar attendees, He'll maintain the WordPress site, which probably has all the discussions and everything, but just make sure that it's all going on, and he'll also attend the seminar. So, appropriate or inappropriate? You give it a thumbs up. You give it a thumbs sideways. Kind of sideways. Okay. Anyone thumbs sideways? One is okay, but the rest are a little... Patrick, you're his opinion. What do you think on this? You say no. He's on, now on, on balance now. Okay. He's gonna... Yeah. That's, that's, and in fact, the funny thing is I've talked to a lot of other professors about this, and there were some that were like, oh, no, that sounds great. And our statement is, no, that's probably best for a work study. Like, a work study isn't necessarily trying to get something out of this. But we kind of think that this approach, and this is what I wanted to float as just an idea, and then... We'll talk a little bit about what we've done. Maybe a way to engage students into thinking about, well, how can I maximize what I'm doing and is this the right thing to be doing? Because we want to have communications with them and to think, especially if you establish what, before the semester, what the RA should be doing, you could take a look at this and say, hey, wait, that's not going to have any professional development for me. I'd, I'd like to talk about that. In any case, after this, I'd like, you know, Martin to come up and talk about what we've done so far. So. <coughs> Just uh, hit. So Michael tried to. I forced him to do a to do a. I don't do this <laughs> stuff, <laughs> right? So he asked me for slides, and so this is my slide. That's his slide. <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't know, the great uh, sociologist, uh, particularly for my field, sociologist of religion, Max Weber, um, uh, in some of his thinking about religion. Uh, <clears throat> wonders how do you go from a cult to a religion and he means he doesn't mean cult pejoratively he he means it in, in a religious study sense which is like a small group of people uh, surrounding a charismatic individual how do you go from those apostles of Jesus to the Vatican how does that happen how do you go to those early followers of the Buddha to this global system right uh, and so he talks about the transition from uh, charisma to routinization or institutionalization. Um, and that's my huge question about how this TA training is going to work and is my sort of entree for thinking about successes and failures of it thus far. Um, it, it was kind of us going, gosh, what should people know? And then we're like, oh, these are good things we think they should know. And then I sort of sat down with whoever happened to show up in these rooms, right? And I said, these are things I think you should know as graduate assistants. And we had very nice conversations for three hours and went through a bunch of material and then they left. And now, now we're at the point though, however, where we're like, we've got to give some structure to this thing. Um, because uh, as handy as my maybe charisma as a teacher for these specific uh, training sessions is, uh, I don't think it's enough, right? I, I don't think there, there's, um, uh, uh, enough rigor, but it gets really, really tricky when, you know, I come from religious studies and then there's people from, you know, doing psychology and SIS and people in arts management. I'm like, what? No, we have an arts management program? Like, I had no idea, right? Like, so, so how do, how do we, um, and I, I think on the one hand, the graduate assistant uh, guidelines that, that we have, and then some of those basic things, they're all really useful. Um, in a sense, but we can't get real specific in these three-hour seminars because it's such a, a massive, massively diverse audience. And then especially between uh, uh, research assistants and TAs, those are very different kinds of skills that you're asked to do. Um, 
So on the whole, I think the students have felt uh, grateful that there is somebody welcoming them uh, in an official capacity from the graduate office um, saying, hey, thanks. We really appreciate you being here. Here's the basic stuff that you need to know to sort of navigate the ins and outs of this job. Um, but it, it has become a little bit of like HR-ish orientation rather than uh, actual training. But I'm not sure that you can do training with that diverse field, right? So, so um, I think this is a great thing that we're doing. I think it's, uh, it's been successful. I think it can be uh, a lot better. Um, we're looking for help in that. I think, you know, ideally perhaps there is a, an orientation uh, as we do it now run by the graduate, um, the Office of, of Graduate Studies, but then perhaps there are college or unit specific uh, trainings that happen and we differentiate between orientation versus training because I think they're very different things because a lot of people want to know yeah how do I grade um, well what are you grading yeah. so we've got that issue and, and it's something that we'll, we'll need to address and to, to sort through um, uh, but I think that the case studies the, these two that Michael put forward are also um, uh, can be developed for a lot of the different issues that are in the graduate uh, graduate assistant guidelines that are there. Uh, the, the things that Marche talked about that we go through to be a time management or FERPA or academic integrity, um, uh, putting together case studies for all of those that I think will be a valuable step forward in the routinization of this uh, of this program. Um, but if uh, I'd love to hear if there were strategies about like. What would you like your graduate assistants to know from the university? What would you, what kinds of skills do we need to develop if you are a graduate assistant? Like, you know, it's the old Rod Stewart song, right? It, what, you know, if you only knew now what you didn't know then, or however that works, right? <laughs> well, you wish um, you knew. Yeah, you wish, you wish. What did you wish you, you knew then that, that, that you know now? Um, so, so that's where we're going to ask for, for your assistance and feedback. Um, I don't think I have anything more structured to say beyond that. And so just there's some questions beyond that that we have for you for to, to begin some discussion and I'll be here to take notes. Um, first of all, is is non-content, I mean, everything's up in the in the in the uh, up in the open. So is non-content specific or university wide RIT orientation feasible? Like should we even continue doing this? If the answer is no, then no. But that's one thing, and, and oh, this still didn't take. Um, what are you currently doing for your RAs and TAs? That's funny, it didn't work. Uh, what should we be doing in RIT training that we don't do? Um, so we've given you a little bit of a sense, but maybe we're missing things, and maybe some of the stuff we do shouldn't be continued to be done. And finally, um, should our orientation be longer? Should it be, we just do three hour sessions. Should it be longer than that? Maybe it should be shorter. Maybe there should be follow-up. So that's kind of some of the things we wanted to get some feedback and ideas from you. So can you, can anyone tell us, does anyone know if they do anything for either TAs or RAs? You guys do stuff, Patrick? We, we do. It's, uh, technically, we only have TAs for one course, which is the, uh, which is the world politics course. And that is sort of closely monitored and supervised. We've got a supervisor for, we have a course coordinator for the different sections, and then we've got the instructor. And the instructor and the course coordinator and I get together and do like a day-long training for them. But it's very disciplinary content specific. It's very course specific. Mm -hmm. So it's how do we do world politics? How do we ensure grading consistency across these sections? How do we deal with these sorts of issues? So on and so forth. The thing that I find in those sessions that it would be awful helpful if we had clarity about the things we're getting elsewhere. It would be some clarity about the pretty clear university policies about things like disability accommodations yep. and mm -hmm. uh, yep. medical excuse notes. I mean, the number of times I have to answer the question, no, the student should not give you a doctor's note directly. Dean of students, FERPA. I mean, this is basic stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but this is the sort of thing they're not, they're not getting elsewhere. It's not just the students, it's also the faculty. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot ask a student to give you a doctor's excuse note that spells out the nature of the diagnosis. I mean, that, 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 you cannot ask a student for that. There's a procedure. I still get those from advisors too. They'll send me. I'm like, no, 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 no,
it's probably more there are probably more policy appropriatenesses on the on the TA side than on the RA side because research and what counts as research is so different across different. Well, that's it. I mean, and that's that's what we've been trying to so, figure out. I mean, we didn't we didn't come in thinking about RA training and and right. if if there is that common, I mean, that's the question is you know not to there's like this common core that you're talking about. Like you all need to know about FERPA, and you're making me think about one thing that we don't cover, which is we don't cover the undergrad rigs. And in some sense, regulations. And in some sense, they're probably really more important than the graduate regulations. I mean, they're not important. They're important to the, the graduate regulations, important to the graduate student as a student. But that's a really good point. We don't go over the regs. Let me suggest that I think part of the problem is trying to lump it together as a single thing called the GA. There's some things that are appropriate to both populations, but then I think it diverges. We actually separated them. Well, we, we, we try. This is like a massively difficult organizational process because we can't actually require anyone to come. We don't have that authority. And so we're like cajoling department chairs, hey, send us your GAs, right? And they sign up for slots. And we say, this is the RA slot, and this is the TA slot. And they don't care. They sign up for whatever. And right. may, or maybe they don't know even what their role is, right? And then they, right. they sign up for something, they show up, and they're like, oh, I found out yesterday I'm an RA. Right. We but but that, that, that's, we share that vision. Yeah. We yeah. want we want separate, we, we divide separate curriculums. And it seems to me that what the, the last thing I'll say, it seems to me that the, the piece that the TA training at the university level should have that the RA training doesn't necessarily have is the session that's going to happen, the panel that's going to happen in the next session on the demographics of the AU student undergraduate population. Mm. Because I think if students walk in and have no understanding of what AU, the AU student body is like, and a grad student often doesn't have any idea what the AU undergraduate student body is like because they're grad student, right? They haven't been undergrad here, so they don't know that. Um, it would be very useful for those students to get a sense of that. We've sometimes tried to do that session for our world politics TAs. It would be lovely if we could use that time doing other things that's because they were going to get precisely that's what something we want to do. University yeah. level that's exactly say, what we want to do. Here's what our students are like. Yeah. Here's the demographics. We let Jimmy Ellis come in and do his song and dance about that, and then that would be lovely. That's our that's so. Perfect. In fact, that's a perfect. We could get Jimmy Ellis to do sort of two. I mean, now that I was thinking, you know, just I didn't even think <laughs> about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. Like, I mean, because I didn't think about even with you know regulations that yeah they need to know about the undergraduate regulations they need to know about that and they need to know about the demographics and we should probably get that right. in the next session. Yeah. And we do, I mean, we, it, it's exactly our model is that we want, we want SIS, for example, with a world politics class to be focused on world politics and not have to worry about, because there are some universalities, like cheating, there's a universality to that. Now, the specific ways in which they could cheat, I guess, is a little bit different. <laughs> but, you know, but but we, have yeah, exactly. we have a cheating policy. If I have to spend 15 minutes on what do you do with the suspected AIC case in SIS versus spending half an hour on this is academic integrity, this is the academic exactly. integrity code, mm -hmm. hey, that's 15 minutes. And that's a good time that you can actually use to do some other things in the course of that training. Okay. I'd love it if that could be kind of outsourced to central. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what we're so. what our goal is. And and then to try and I mean the other thing is I mean this is the first time we've been talking about this to anyone outside of our sort of little core group is to try and give you a sense of saying, hey, I mean we'll probably after this get together and say this is going to be our curriculum and then send it out to everybody and say this is the curriculum, this is what we're covering so that when you're designing your training, you say, oh yeah, I don't have to worry about that. Yeah, so this so I'm from biology, um, and we just, a couple days ago, had our first TA training for just the students who were teaching in the sciences. So chemistry, biology, physics, NBS, psychology. Uh, and we made the really um, specific decision to have this before the semester began. Because come Monday, mm -hmm. it is crazy out yes. there. Mm -hmm. And the first two or three weeks are the craziest, especially for the grad students, because they're just arriving. So. Um, and, and you know, when we did our training and we arranged it, we thought, oh, this is great because we're going to get some science-specific stuff. But most of what we covered was not science-specific. But the perception from our TAs that they were going to be treated as scientists, and so they were all sort of on the same, doing the same things in, lab, you know, in a lab course and had the same responsibilities and sort of spoke the same language was, I think, really important in getting them to interact and treat the training as really valuable. So I love the idea of covering like academic integrity on this mass scale, because everyone needs to talk about it, 
but there's something to the perception that here we've customized this training just for the social sciences, for the natural sciences, or for SIS. And I think that has to happen at some level. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I don't think this is, so in, I in fact, I... I know you didn't yeah. try and replace it, but if you could, if we could really separate those things, maybe put some of your stuff online so that they can access it. Come, if they need to think about documentation or FERPA, they can go and see a little video or... And it, I know it's all the there. Is it's all, all just, yeah. yeah. There. I know, but it's not, I think a video would be really helpful. A document is just too tough to wade through at, in the moment. I, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's just a thought. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, we've played with, we've been putting videos online and- Yeah, we and, do have videos of our graduate regulations. Yeah, and I don't think they get used. I mean, the problem is there's too much stuff online. online. I mean, yeah. and, and everyone will go, yeah, 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 and then sort of ignore it. But maybe but. you could also train, like the, the folks of us who are working sort of at this departmental or school or sort of mm -hmm. cohort level, you might be able to sort of teach us how to teach our students. And so it would still <laughs> have a... It, I would love not, that. It's, we're I totally mean, happy, happy not to have any more responsibilities. Yeah. But I think this perception of customization for a, a unified mm -hmm. TA set, especially because our students are not just TAs or RAs, they do both. Yeah, no, so, no, no, right, I'm, I'm in mathematics, it's training. the same thing. Yeah, so Which I don't, were we even in the really science fun. groups or no? <laughs> there was math in it. Did that come? Math to was there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's the. I mean, yeah, but there, so. there's a. No, I know they have both, right. and that's kind of one of those things that we'd like people to be thinking about that kind of stuff. The, the and in fact, I would say, considering what goes on in mathematics and statistics, our RAs and TAs are probably a little more limited for what they're doing. I think the training actually for the RAs is probably really critical. I mean that. So, you know, issues of how do you Author, authority for writing who 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 gets um who gets uh, uh, authors authorship in a paper mm -hmm. should I be authored should I not be authored that's a really interesting thing and I so I was looking into whether we have stuff and we do do some stuff I, you guys probably know about RCR that's the responsibilities and research training um, we have to all graduate students have to go through this training it's an online training um, but there's different modules, and some of them are on plagiarism, you know, like uh, intellectual plagiarism. And so we were actually joking that we might, because we bought it, we might plagiarize the plagiarism. And use that to, uh, yeah. to do our training, which is legal because we bought it. Um, but. Uh, so that's required for students to take? They have to take some uh, research and responsibilities. And that's, that's an online training that they. You're like, we do? <laughs> yeah, we're from that course here yeah. as a PhD student. I, I never had to take that. Huh? No one I know for certain federally yeah, funded grants, you have to take it. Um, well, is there an enforcement about like, The RCR, it's, it's not for it's not for, for PhDs. Okay. So you're. So a, I, I was direct admission to PhD here, so I've never heard of this. What's your history? They may not. I wonder in history if we have to I do. I don't. It. Think, I think it's that for certainly federally funded grants. I was like, yeah, no, it's not. No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. See, yeah. those kinds of disparities or sort of weirdnesses make you sort of go, oh, okay, whatever. If I haven't heard about it, it doesn't apply to me. Yeah, but sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah maybe yeah, someone that does need to know that, and like, I, need, I know about this. So does that still need to be addressed? I'm Kathy McGinnis, and I work uh, part-time in institutional research doing outcomes and assessment. But I also worked in graduate school at the University of Maryland, ah. where I was a professor for 25 years. And um, there's a reason we have a, a graduate school at Maryland. There's a reason you all have graduate office, and that is you want some things to be constant across. That's right, absolutely. And if you can back up and ask yourselves, what is it that we want them all to know, no matter where they are, and I think academic integrity is certainly one. I think sexual harassment yep. is, mm -hmm. is another yeah, we, one. Yeah, we were careful you know, about that one. But year, what they sure. do at Maryland, and of course they have this huge variety of tasks that are assigned as assistantships at Maryland. They have day kind of like Ann Farron, where the grad assistants come. There's not the tremendous variety of choices, but there are two or three sessions every hour and then they have a nice, they have a picnic lunch, uh, but they can choose and they have some things, especially for the sciences, 
some things, especially for the humanities, they always cover grading, they always cover office hours and how you do effective communication with students, how to use email ethically. There, you know, there's a wide variety, and a lot of those sessions are run by experienced graduate students, and they love it. They really like it. And every now and then, a session is taught by the professor and his or her grad assistant, where they together talk about how we work in the lab together, how we decide who does what in the course. Um, and it's very effective. They really, they really tend to learn, because there's so much, and it's so varied. Um, that's a good way. And then they have a common a lunch speaker that sort of goes over something that is a hot issue now. Uh, wh whatever the big, uh, I think right now it would have to be Title IX, sexual harassment, uh, certainly on that campus it would. Um, but it, it works pretty well. And the, uh, at first, nobody came. You know, when they started 20 years ago, nobody came. So it wasn't required. And it wasn't required. I don't think it's required now. I think it's required by pro groups. Mm -hmm. Like psych makes all of their TAs come. You know, there's some departments that make everybody come. But they come anyway. They all come. Uh, you're afraid they're not going to know something. One thing I really like about it is that it stresses the specialness of being a TA or an RA. Is that it's not a job, clock it in and clock it out job. You've got this responsibility to your students, you have a responsibility to the institution, to your professor, you're part of the institution. And it's not just a job too, and that it's your first way of getting into the institution, of getting into the academy. So it's, uh, it's good, and they have a lot of discussions about things like that, but that's what they do. Um, the other one I'm familiar with is at UNC, and it's fairly similar. And I've always thought they both did it this way because they're so big. You know, there's really no other way to do it but to have multiple sessions. Well, what would you, let me ask a question based on what Kathy said. What would you think of a day long, do you think that would be be not welcome? Um, a day long session having? I think they go 10 to 3. Oh, mm -hmm. well. You know, because of traffic. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that's <laughs> Would that be, Free I mean, lunch? it. Yeah. And they <laughs> love the lunch, they love the picnic. <laughs> I mean, that's a possibility, but you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of conflicting things that people have at different times, and so. But they have this before the semester begins. They do oh, we would, and, and we do some of ours before mm -hmm. the semester begins. Yeah, too. it's on a day in August and a day in January. Yeah. Grad students, what do you think? I I think it's important, and it's something that you know I I think I would take advantage of. Uh, one of the things. And I want to echo some of the sentiment about this this kind of specialization uh, in you know doing something for social sciences, natural sciences, humanities. Mm -hmm. I think that's important because I'm thinking about can you do a blanket RA training? I don't I, think you I can. really don't think you can. I think that's something to think about less than the TA training. There's a lot of things that are applicable across the board for TAs. Mm -hmm. Whereas I'm not going to get anything out of sitting in the room talking about co-authorship and order of names and working in a lab and IRB versus hearing someone tell me, how do you ethically do archival research? Right. You know, and those things, I don't think you can pair together. And I think that's in, in terms of the RA training where there needs to be some separation if it's gonna happen. It might need to be at the departmental level. Um, but I think in terms of uh, <coughs> dealing with FERPA, dealing with academic integrity, dealing with all yep. of those things, uh, it, it's stuff that I, I've learned through other work I've done at the university, but not through my department. So I think if there does need to be something at, at your level, coming out of the Office of Graduate Studies that, that addresses that, because I think there is something lacking there. My area was journalism, so there were only about six or eight new grad students a year. And we'd split it up, you know, that one would go to each session, and then they met separately and shared what they had learned in the other sessions. That was the other. So what, what we, one of the things that we had thought about, we talked about communication being one of the key things. And so, for example, with the RA, one of the things that is really tricky and I think is more critical as an RA than as a TA is communication with your supervisor. Yeah. And that's one of the things that we wanted to really focus on is 
how do you get, you know, how establishing, how often do you meet? What are your expectations for me doing this? Uh, what will this look like? You know, am I going to be, am I with you for the whole time? How will this evolve? How often, I mean, there's, there's some interesting work on mentorship that's out there and that is some of the place I see for it because you're right. I can't go into, into some of, uh, the specific issues. I mean, I'm a mathematician and our fields are so separate. I'm not going to get into the distinctions and I don't think I want to really, really stress this. What we do is not complete and doesn't intend to be complete, but it, it yeah, can't be, and it shouldn't be. But, you know, there are bigger issues, and really that relationship with your professor, that's a biggie. Mm -hmm. And that's one that we probably want to try and stress, that how do you do these things and what's appropriate? Because I think actually, to be honest, RAs are the ones that get taken advantage of more. TAs, you really feel funny if the TA is not working on something that's at least educational. They're not picking up your dry cleaning. RAs are, it's a lot more open. And so you're more open to funny things going on. And we've seen that at our end, that there's strange situations that arise. And so trying to establish, well, what are appropriate boundaries? What's appropriate assignment? And not appropriate specifically to history, but like, what could you do? But then I really think that something has to go on beyond that, that's customized. Yeah. Um, as a first year doctoral student, I went through the orientation with Mark earlier, um, and I thought it was valuable. I mean, we talked about almost everything we're talking about here as far as policies and AU and academic integrity and sexual harassment. Uh, and I thought that those three hours were extremely informative on sort of the HR aspect of, of being a graduate assistant. Um, but I still walked away from that, and I'm an SPA, and I don't know if it's different in other departments and other schools, but. Like, I don't know how to do data management. I don't know how to do file management for major research projects. I don't know how to write a grant or even assist with doing that. Um, you know, and the grading stuff, you know, we talk about, it might be something that's kind of universalized across the, the university, but I mean, I don't, I don't know where to get those skills other than by getting <laughs> thrown into the deep end and, and doing it. Um, so we offer some stuff actually right now. Yeah, she our, could, yeah. Yeah, our graduate um, enhancement workshop series. <clears throat> um, we are going to be doing a workshop on statistical software and kind of what research is available on campus as far as qualitative and quantitative. So no, I think it's James. Just out of curiosity, what is that, in, like, is it like an introduction to here are the different types of, like, right, yes. Mm -hmm. All right, I've had lots okay, of had I that. don't need that. Okay. What I need is, all right, I, my professor that I work for uses Stata. How on earth do I put stuff into Stata and make it useful? How do I manage it? How do I merge different data sets? How do I find data So sets? what this would do is this will give you, this will be an introduction to what are the, the resources that are on campus that can help you out with that. Like the Cisco Consulting Center and actually going through and looking at the problems and how we've had some issues with some of those not like issues with those <laughs> organizations but it's very difficult to get exactly what we need because a lot of times we're not armed with the question that we need to ask and get the information that we're looking for so the what they can do is that you will have an opportunity to talk to those people and say here's what I need here's what here's what they're expecting here's what you're expecting and that doesn't mean that, I mean, because I, I know the people that run the Stat Consulting Center, that's my department. And they, I'm not into them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, and they will, be. right, they won't do your research for you. Sure. And they also need to have a cogently formed question. Yeah. But, you know, but there are, I mean, those things, I agree that those are really critical. And part of it is trying to get out the word. And I don't know if you've heard about those enhancement seminars. I, I got a sheet the first week I was mm -hmm. in school here and yeah. Yeah. Simpler sense. But I think one thing you might include in if you're going to do this for five hours is um, for RAs advanced techniques for literature searching that cross disciplinary boundaries mm -hmm. because oh, a, lot of, a lot of students in, in certain especially in certain disciplines can go can Google their way to a BA, but then when they're tasked with doing serious literature searches as a first year undergraduate. So maybe have someone from the library? Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then also that, and then we did that at our training, and it was a nice, was good. just a little piece of, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, that's a great and, idea. And, and then emphasize we have, I think at last count, 517 different online literature databases and also data, <laughs> numeric data contained databases that the university pays a lot of money for. So to emphasize that to the graduate students. 
and then as a segue to the departmental specific training on specific resources. And I want to follow up with his question that he said, like everything just fell off. Should we have a follow up? The deal at Maryland is that they can keep coming. You know, they're different sessions. And oh, and so you change it up so they can come back. I mean, oh, you okay. come when you're a new. So you have, so like you, like you said, it's like Ann Farron and you go to sessions and then you could go right. to a second session. You would run those same sessions again in the fall. And then you would, so like, in, spring, in, yeah. in the spring, have that session again and, and add another couple of sessions on a slightly different topic so they can still get some more information from it. Right. Okay. And it seems to me like there's a way to leverage, if not the resources, at least the model of the Academic Support and Access Center, where they have this sort of suite of options throughout the semester, uh, time management, taking written comps, researching. They have a lot of things that I think you either working, collaborating with them, or using that model where you have, as you're mentioning, these sessions where you keep coming back, you have this initial sort of introductory day-long thing, and then you present, oh, by the way, we have this schedule of, of classes that are related to these topics that, that you can keep. Well, and that's kind of what we think of the enhancement seminars for. I mean, that's mm -hmm. sort of what they are. They come up, what, about every two weeks? Every two weeks or so. And, and we generally keep them the same every semester. We have a few that change. We do like time management, um, the statistical one coming up. Um, for people publishing their dissertation digitally, there's a workshop for that. Grant writing is pretty uh, pretty popular. There's two of those. Um, and so those is there financial. There's there's a financial one too. There's a financial. Yeah, one about um, and maybe some financial. teaching topics could be mixed in. Yeah, and no, we haven't yeah. done that as much. No. That actually gets to the question I have. What percentage of TAs include in their job description standing in front of a classroom? presenting oral. Oh, what a great question. Um, <laughs> Very so, good question. So this, this became a sore spot for me because I asked a question which said, so what do you do for your TA on, the, on that survey? And the reason it's a sore spot is 20% says, and this was already into the semester, said, I don't know what I'm doing. Two weeks I, in. I don't, I don't, no I don't know. I, I, I still haven't done anything, okay. um, which I found right. not acceptable. Yeah. Um, because you should not, if you're two weeks into the semester and you haven't started doing anything, that's... That's why you have an office but, of graduates. I know. <laughs> right, yeah. you get this that's the reason right there. But the, you know, rough ballpark, you know, my graduate experience meant TA ship was, you know, you found out the semester before, you will teach these four sections of, you know, the discussion sections of this bigger class, kind of the way that, that Pat talked about ours. Is that half of our TAs do that as their... Yeah, I mean, there is so much everyone, everyone variability but, you know. from even within okay. departments from okay. professor to professor because okay. there aren't, right? Like, okay. I have a colleague whose TA just grades, period. Doesn't even need, yep. this was told she doesn't even need to come to class. <laughs> just <laughs> can, right? that just grade, yeah. right? Okay. I, I'm like, okay. let's sit down with the syllabus. What are you interested in? You will lecture on these, right. you know, two or three topics, yeah. and okay. because so professional to me, the, the, development, yeah. actually. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's but, the thing is that know, grading, okay. not and, really that great for. I mean, okay for the beginning of a professional okay. development, not great for your entire career. Because okay. to me, the one thing I remember from uh, my TA training, you know, we had a very robust one, yeah, it, where I went, was that you were required to attend the class on presenting in you know, a lecture. And then you were required to be videotaped your first yep, quarter. I had that too. Giving a, you know, leading a class discussion. Hmm. You know, and that was because everybody was doing it within that department, yeah. our, with our school. Yeah. That was understood. That was part of your job. But yeah. I'm sorry. You know, if they don't mentor well, so if we don't encourage good mentoring of TAs, then they're going to grow up to be professors who don't mentor TAs very well. Yeah, that's, a, that's a concern that's, for us, yeah. too. Yeah. That's where I come in. I'm Janet Otten. I teach the um, graduate pedagogy seminar in the Department of Literature. So um, my, my research is on um, graduate teacher education. Um, and so I've been wading in the, the literature for quite some time. And um, a lot of, of what's being out there being written about TA training is the need to um, just as you had the the and and the second part of, of the benefits should be to the students um, is the need to train teachers um, in the for the academy you know to, to train faculty to teach 
And I'm going to make there, a plug. Yeah. There are mm -hmm. things, um, you know, I know there's the Greenberg seminars and, and other things that the university does, but there are some skills um, that you might be able to offer in a TA session um, and talk about uh, reading classrooms, um, get, as Patrick would say, getting to know who the students are and understanding student learning that do go across disciplines um, and maybe presentation skills mm -hmm. and things like that that would benefit them instead of, you know, even if, if their particular mentor just gives them grading, at least they'll have a little skill set to, to take. Work with. But format-wise, I think, I don't think we can disagree on this, format-wise, something like that is probably a better handle than an ongoing series than a one-shot orientation. Yeah, but there, there might, you might want to add um, some kind of uh, workshop hour-long two-hour workshop on, you know, classroom. Well, if I have my magic mm -hmm. wand, I wave my magic wand, the existing Greenberg seminars disappear, and they're turned into something that's actually useful, which is to say a series <laughs> of... Tell us what you really think. A series, <laughs> yeah. of, uh, a series of ongoing seminar meetings where graduate students and distinguished members of the faculty across the university when they get together and actually puzzle out issues that are really involved in doing excellent classroom teaching. You get that about a third of the time in Greenberg if you're lucky. Um, and then a lot of the time you get a lot of other crap. I mean, it doesn't really do anything, right? And, and I say this having been involved in, in doing the Greenberg seminars and trying to sort of you know, change the direction of that particular uh, 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 ocean liner. Uh, um, it, 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 well, and Greenberg is, is is limited just to PhDs, right? And right. half well, but, of but, our GAs. But what I'm are, saying is, again, my magic wand yeah. here would have eliminated because we don't just use PhD candidates in these roles across. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Right? right. And so we say, look, let's look at the population that's actually doing these things. One, the first and year of physics sent their their right. senior undergrads because they run labs. And we're fine with that. Yeah, I, think that's great. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and again, they, they, there's questions about sort of exactly, you know, exactly sort of what, you know, what, what kinds of things are appropriate for that. But if we were to say, like, there is an ongoing commitment as being a TA at the university, and you are involved in something that's actually practically useful. I mean, look, the only way, I, the only thing that I ever did in my entire career that helped me learn how to teach was when I was a, well, Columbia didn't call it a TA, they called it a preceptor, which was Latin for we have to pay you as much. <laughs> and um, it was for the for the uh, for the contemporary civilization course. And the way the contemporary civilization course worked, you had a course syllabus for about two thirds of the content, and you could fill in a third on your own. And what we did is there were weekly meetings of the people teaching that course, and it was two hour meeting. It was grad students only with the course coordinator for the first hour, and then it was the whole faculty. And people were talking about various issues and how would you deal with this sort of issue in Plato and whatever. So there were those kinds of things. But then you would talk about stuff like how do you do your exams? How do you grade your exams? What kind of interesting student issues are you running into? It's like case conference and a lot of that sort of stuff. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the mechanics of making that be less disciplinary or less course specific are. But it does seem to me that talking about teaching in the abstract is useless unless you've got people actually teaching who are lo doing live feedback and, hey, this is an issue I actually ran into in my classroom. Let's think through this kind of thing. I think that's separate from an orientation. Mm -hmm. yes. I think mm -hmm. that's, that would be a, a longer-term project that would be extraordinarily valuable for people who are teaching in that sort of a TA capacity on campus. It doesn't exclude the idea of a TA orientation, but they would handle different kinds well, of Well, and I, I agree. I mean, I want to say two things. First of all, the, and the mentorship issue, and in particular with the faculty, where I think the mentorship, the, the relationship with the faculty and, and students really resides at the faculty level. Um, Marche is going to be holding a session. Mm -hmm. in, February 18th to talk, yep. discuss mentoring and some different ways that you can kind of gauge what the relationship look like, should look like and kind of where you're, how you're going to meet in the middle as far as personalities between faculty member and student that's being mentored. On that second issue uh, that Patrick is raising, I agree that I, I like the fact that we, Marche was the one who did keep me into saying call this orientation, and I agree with her. It's an orientation because the training, <laughs> I don't believe training happens before you've ever set foot in the classroom. Yeah, yeah. 
And I love the idea, and I actually, when I was a graduate student, established the idea of TA training that happened in your third year. Um, and I think that's when you can start to do things. And maybe that isn't the model of the Greenberg seminars, but that's a different story. And I think that's, that's something worth pursuing. So if you developed, if you cut out the Greenberg and sort of developed something that was really robust and rigorous and met weekly, why can't we make it required? I mean, we're giving students money. You can. I can't. You can. You can. <laughs> no, 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 no. I can't. And you will never be able to? You can. We can. I can't. I can't. If you, we're decentralized. Yeah, you're just if you, you if you, we don't yeah, make those degree. kinds of decisions. If okay. your program says we value this and we're willing to tell students to go do it, you can. The college could. The college um, could. could. Your department could. The university cannot. Not the way it's set up. But I do want to be weary of time, and I can see that uh, they're whispering about yeah. that they need to turn this off. So, uh, <laughs> so you're not so self. No, so no, no, it's okay. It's totally fine. So thank you guys so much for coming. I took yeah. lots of great notes on this. We Very really helpful. appreciate your feedback, and we'll try and post uh, something that uh, talks about what we're doing when we develop the curriculum next time. Thank you all. Thanks a bunch. Thank you so much. <laughs>